Right, good day. I'm uh, Dr. Ernest Gunasekara Rockwell, editor in chief of the Journal of Indo Pacific Affairs and director of the Consortium of Indo Pacific Researchers. In collaboration with the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies and the Joint Special Operations University, we would like to welcome you to do today's session on Arctic strategy. We are fortunate to have an all star panel with us today, many of whom contributed to our recently published special issue on Arctic affairs. Please allow me to introduce our panelists and our moderator. First, uh, Major General Randy Church Key, U.S. Air Force retired, serves as the Senior Advisor for Arctic Security Affairs to the D Department of Defense. He assists with, is also assisting with establishing the Ted Stevens Center, and uh, the, which is the sixth and newest regional center. Uh, Key is responsible for supporting the establishment and early operations of this new DOD institution with the mission to engage in regional and global security issues through research, communication, and education. The goal of the center is to build strong, sustainable international networks of security leaders to advance, excuse me, <clears throat> U.S. national security priorities in the Arctic region. Church will also work with partner nations to ensure a, a stable rules-based order in the Arctic that will benefit the United States and all Arctic nations. Next, we have Dr. Lillian Doc Alyssa. Uh, got ahead of myself. Uh, she is a direct, uh, president's professor at the University of Idaho and is affiliate faculty with the Texas a the University of Texas A&M and George Mason University Systems. She has previously served as a defense intelligence senior level equivalent, special advisor for advanced data and analytics through an intergovernmental personnel act arrangement with the Department of Defense. Additionally, she served as deputy chief of global strategy with the Department of Homeland Security, Office of Strategy, Policy and Plans. She's currently chief scientist with Joint Special Operations University and also providing Arctic expertise to the Department of Defense. Next, we have Colonel Matthew Nicholson, Deputy Commander, 11th Air Force, Joint Base Elmendorf, Richardson, Alaska. He, <clears throat> he serves as Chief Advisor to the Commander in executing the Air Component Mission in Alaska, Hawaii, and Guam. Colonel Nicholson graduated from the United States Air Force Academy in 1996. He has held a variety of operational flying and staff assignments. He is a command pilot with more than 2,100 hours. He's been qualified as a combat ready pilot since 2000, deploying in support of Operations Southern Watch, Iraqi Freedom, and Noble Eagle. Dr. Ryan Burke is a professor of military and strategic studies at the U.S. Air Force Academy and a veteran Marine Corps officer. He is the co director of Project 6633 at the Modern War Institute, where he was also a two-term non-resident fellow from 2019 to 2021. Ryan is the research director for Yusafa's Homeland Defense Initiative, or Institute, sorry, and is an affiliate faculty member at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Center for Arctic Security and Resilience. Next, Lieutenant Colonel Jahara Frankie Matasik, PhD, is a senior fellow for the Homeland Defense Institute. He's an active duty US Air Force officer and senior pilot serving as associate professor in the military and strategic studies department at the United States Air Force Academy and is the director of fellows for the Irregular Warfare Initiative. Next, Dr. Victoria Herman was previously the president and managing director of the Arctic Institute. She is currently on a year long sabbatical to complete a fellowship and will return to the Arctic Institute in fall 2022. In addition to managing the Institute and Board of Directors, her research and writing focuses on climate change, community adaptation, resilient development, and migration. And finally, for our panelists, we have Ms. Anu Sharma, who is a PhD scholar at the Center for International Politics at the School of International Studies, Central University of Gujarat in India. And she's also an associate fellow at the Center for Air Power Studies in New Delhi, India as well. And our moderator for today's session is Lieutenant Commander Amy D. Bruce, a Naval Intelligence Officer with a Master's in Defense and Strategic Studies from the Naval War College. Amy currently serves as a liaison to the United States, uh, United, U.S. State Department's Bureau for Intelligence and Research on behalf of U.S. Special Operations Command. 
I thank all of our participants and our audience for joining us today and hand the show over to Lieutenant Commander Bruce. The floor is yours, Amy. Thanks, sir. Um, and thank you and Air University for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, I, uh, as a moderator today, my role is very small. Um, I am only to be literate and be able to tell time. And so I offer those skills to you humbly today. Um, this is gonna go in challenge question format. Um, and in fairness to the panelists, I'm going to offer up each question to a couple of panelists. Um, but when the remarks are over, I would ask that any panelist that has an additional remark to please just chip in. Um, my plan for today is to go with regard to the, the questions that have been provided is kind of go uh, from where we have come from as far as narratives and uh, observations in, of the strategic environment over the past couple of decades to what we predict we're going to see. Um, and, and how, what is going to be required uh, to answer those challenges. And then we'll round out with, finally, are we prepared? Um, and do we need a new narrative? So that, that is my plan <laughs> for today. And, and so I won't uh, belabor the, the rules any further. I'm going to open um, with uh, General Key and Doc Alessa, uh, definitely part of the old guard with regard to um, Arctic security. Um, and when we talk about old narratives. I'd like to start with General Key. Um, old narratives uh, surrounding Arctic security, um, what are those and how have those shaped our current narratives um, and, and are, that, are they doing us uh, a service as part of that? So uh, General Key, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, uh, Commander. I'm grateful for the gift of your time um, and for all the folks on this panel today. Uh, appreciate your uh, the commitment of your time to to pull the thread a little bit further forward regarding the terms of Arctic security in a modern context, in a current context. Several things from my vantage point. Uh, I've been called a member of the old guard before, but uh, so it's been a while <laughs> I've heard that term used. Uh, so honored to honored to try to help in this regard. Strategically, along with my dear colleague uh, Dr. Alessa, um, we've been worrying. About about the Arctic as a national, national security interest for uh, quite a long time. Uh, strategically, the, if you, the legacy terminology would be the aspects that uh, in starting in, in uh, perhaps in 2000, January 2007, when uh, with the advent of uh, reestablishment of Russian long range aviation, um, the, the, the paradigm of the peace flow in the Arctic was given a little bit of a context and challenge. Um, the reality is that the Arctic uh, is a zone where many people desire a non-militarized approach. Uh, it, the problem challenge with this is the Arctic has been militarized by, by several nations uh, in the aspects of looking at the Arctic from a, a zone of competition. The reality is not competition un, unhinged or, or without some sort of management parameters. And there is, uh, the Arctic is a reason where stability has been a watchword and a desired outcome. The Arctic is relatively stable today, but it's not necessarily one that will stay that way unless, if, if you will, that the nations who are in, have a vested interest in seeking that stability and invest their time, effort, and energy in a complement of power uh, vantage points. There is hard power requirements. There's a need to respond and be capable to respond to secure and defend our respective national interests. The United States, of course, is very fortunate to have an array of allies and partners that seek stability in and across the region. Uh, and certainly working with our allies and partners, we got to look at the aspect of the Arctic as a region where full spectrum uh, security means looking at traditional uh, national nation state sponsored stability challenges, security challenges, but also that for the non uh, the non-traditional vantage point, the aspects that classic strategic competition is uh, harken back to the vestiges of the Cold War in which we're able to maintain between the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the Union of Soviet Republics. During that time frame, stability in the region was was really kind of a because managed because of a, essentially a parity uh, of, of power and really being able to to have maneuverings uh, among the uh, NATO forces and Soviet forces in a way that, that respected each other, their mechanisms of de-escalation, they're well-established in war. 
um, in the period following this, the, the Cold War to, again, that period of that I'd call the reestablishment of strategic uh, power challenges in the region in January of 2007. That interlude between 1989 and that time and 2007 was one where there was a strong desire to really look at the, at the Arctic exceptionalism as the driving force that we can find ways to work with each other that it was uh, peaceful outcomes of the Arctic region were, were heretofore relatively assured simply because there was no power challenge in that region. However, today, of course, uh, following the reestablishment of, of kind of strategic competition from a military vantage point, um, again, starting around 2007, you see, of course, nations uh, that are Arctic nations themselves seeking a way to uh, have security as part of the equation and securing our respective national interests. But then it's also not just about the nations that are that have sovereign territory in the Arctic. There are uh, state and non-state sponsored activities in and around the Arctic region that do require uh, a very thoughtful, a very strategic, a very purposeful and intentional planning and efforts to have a complement of hard and soft power complements to essentially help ensure that we can have a, a maintain the Arctic as a region of stability. So I'd offer the floor to my distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Lessa for her reflections. And thank you for that opening uh, opening question, Amy. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Amy. The only pieces I would add to that, with that foundation of understanding the Arctic, is that our narratives have become very comfortable. So you can, you can check off all the topics that will go in with mention seals, changes in flora and fauna, and of course, the uh, maritime and uh, weather conditions that are changing up there, affecting things like search and rescue and humanitarian assistance, disaster response. The, um, oh, the audio is garbled. Okay, uh, stand by, please. In the meantime, Just gonna do a test here, how is that? Okay, excellent. So f following, following off that, the activities that are taking place in the Arctic have moved outside our characterization of it as a changing environmental space and into a changing operational space that will surprise us. There is a desire just because of the complexities of the Arctic to shove it to the side as a minimal theater of operations that we as the United States and our allies should be concerned. However, from the NATO perspective, many of our allies are, are very concerned and for them, it is a theater, not only of emerging potential, but of realized potential as the activities undertaken by both China and Russia uh, increase significantly. Quite, <clears throat> quite often, there is a discounting of what we would call the irregular activities and those are foundational to asymmetric competition. So in asymmetric competition, we refer to activities that are taken in the best interests of other nations that do not have our best interests at stake. We do see increased activity in the Arctic and quite often our narratives default to separating the science from the operations and that gap in between, that science of operations or the operational science is something that is bound not only by tradition and old narratives, but also by a, a uh, politicization of the Arctic for several reasons. If we can move beyond that and look at the operational pieces as they extend in a planetary system, I think we will have a better grasp of the significance to the Arctic, of the Arctic, to our national defense forecasts and planning. I yield. Thanks, Doc, I appreciate it. Um, and thanks also to General Key for your comments regarding um, the old narratives. I, I opened the question to the group um, regarding where we've been um, as far as old narratives and how those are impacting what you're seeing um, from your seats uh, now. And I, and I offered it up to the group. Sorry, uh, Amy, I, you were cut out for the last uh, 
about the last 15, 20 seconds of your discussion. Could you repeat if that was a question? I, I just literally didn't catch it, over. Sorry, sir. I um, I thank you both for your comments. Um, and then I, I offer it up to the, the panelists um, regarding old narratives. Where, where else uh, are we seeing those impact our current narratives um, to the rest of the panelists? Thanks. Okay. Thank um, you. Amy, can I start? Hi. Okay. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Anu Sharma from India. And I, before I uh, uh, put in my input, I would like to thank Dr. Rafael and A University for giving me this opportunity. I'm definitely the most junior to this August panel, so I will be only giving my two cents and will be grasping most of what is possible from this August panel. Uh, so I totally agree with uh, Randy, sir, and what uh, uh, Doc uh, actually mentioned, that uh, the old narrative has been about militarization. But I think the old narrative has also been about the resource extraction and uh, utilization of the, uh, of the region uh, for uh, militarization and uh, which is uh, which shifted from the uh, during the Cold War uh, to the present times to being more about the transit routes. So I think that is uh, the narrative which we have been seeing since, uh, as uh, uh, Randy sir mentioned, uh, since 2007. It has become more about the uh, transit route, uh, like uh, according to Russia, like north uh, uh, northwestern sea route, something like that. Thanks, Anu. I appreciate that. Um, in the in the essence of time, uh, I you brought up the the transition um, to to transit routes, and and my next question is regard with regard to what changes we've seen over the past couple of decades. Um, and if if Doc Herman has joined us, I, I would start with her. But if she hasn't, I'll pitch it to uh, Doc Burke and uh, Colonel Nicholson. Um, if you could provide just sort of your insight on what, what we've seen over the past couple of decades with regard to Arctic security um, and, and the strategic environment of the Arctic. Um, and perhaps Colonel Nicholson, if you could also expound on some of the, the operational perspective that you have from your perch, um, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Maybe I'll take it from here. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you uh, to Air University and to Doc uh, Rockwell for hosting this, this event. Uh, joining you from uh, from cloudy and rainy Cambridge, Massachusetts today. So I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance if the internet goes in and out. Um, had a hard time getting on the uh, the call at the beginning, so my apologies in advance if I do happen to, to cut out. Uh, Amy, if, if I do, just uh, start shouting and uh, I'll know to shut up and then I'll try to re recalibrate and, and reconnect, okay? Um, to, to answer the question about the, the changes in the strategic environment, I think over the last 20 years, if, if we want to think about the, the recent changes versus the old changes, uh, really we saw, I think, a line of demarcation that occurred back in uh, really at the end of the Cold War. I mean, if we and, uh, and Major General Key and a handful of the other panelists have already alluded to this fact, uh, but what we tend to forget in the modern day conversation about Arctic security, Arctic militarization, is that the Arctic has, yes, it has been a zone of peace, it's been a zone of exceptionalism, right, by way of our international cooperation. Um, however, it uh, it also has been, and this is a this is an objective fact. You can look this up. It also has been one of the most militarized nation, or excuse me, one of the most militarized regions on the planet, uh, and it was so during the during the Cold War. So when you look at the actual Russian military presence, or this, at the time the Soviet military presence back in the uh, between the '60s and the '80s, um, and even into the early '90s when they started to, uh, to kind of dismantle some of their their facilities. This was a region that was teeming with, to excuse the hyperbole, but uh, it was a region teeming with military facilities, maybe not on the North American side, maybe not on, from a NATO perspective, uh, but the Russians were certainly were certainly active, or the Soviets again, were certainly active in the Arctic during the, the entirety of the Cold War. And, uh, and the United States did engage in quite a bit, and I could uh, yield to Major General Key on this um, from his Air Force background, but the United States certainly did engage in quite a bit of uh, kind of over the horizon uh, strategic power projection uh, movements and, and certainly uh, uh, sorties by way of Air Force bombers just to, again, maintain a presence, if not engage in or project vigilance 
uh, in the Arctic during that time. So we, I think that's important context to, to ground the conversation, ground the evolving narrative in the sense that the Arctic has been and has experienced militarization, maybe not necessarily military conflict, but this has been a region of strategic importance for decades, even prior to the advent of 21st century great power competition, or now the this new phrase of strategic competition that the Biden administration has adopted. So it's important to remember that. So, to, but to, it's a long-winded way to get to the, the, the shorter answer. As far as the changes are concerned, I think what we're seeing now is, at least in my opinion, through my research and, and my engagements with uh, with various uh, folks in, in and around the world that have that have Arctic interests representing various states. What I'm seeing more and more of is less cooperation, less inclination toward these global governance mechanisms and more self-interest. Self-interest is, is prevailing more and more and more. And as the Arctic changes, as its environment physically changes, as, it's, as the geopolitical nature changes, what we are seeing is more and more nations, more states, excuse me, with, with interest and really driving uh, self-interest, moving themselves into this region. And uh, what I think that's a, a big, big departure from what we had previously seen in the even in the Cold War era, where a lot of this, even before the Arctic Council was established in 96, we still had a lot of governance initiatives, we had a lot of collaboration and, and even some cooperation, we still do today, let's not make any mistake, there still is cooperation in the Arctic. But again, as resource scarcity continues to, to uh, present itself as a global challenge, right? As, as the Arctic opens and accessibility increases, there are more and more and more opportunities for states with increasingly um, dramatic and or uh, pressing self-interest to pursue their own interest in, an, and frankly, in an ungoverned space. This is the last point I'll make on this and I'll yield the floor. The Arctic is a global common. Right. It is a high sea. It is a global common. There are no, I understand international law. We can get into a whole debate on, on, the, on the merits and benefits of international law. Um, you can probably surmise from my, my tone that uh, what, I, what I view of international law and its overall utility in, uh, in governing uh, state actions in, in international waters in particular. So, uh, so let's not forget about some of these things. But again, two points again to summarize, the Arctic has been militarized. And so the fact that it's becoming more militarized today, that's not in and of itself a major surprise. It has been before. Uh, but secondly, the major change that I see is, is increasingly prevailing state self-interest, driving actions, driving activity that we all need to be aware of and that we all need to to find ways to at least uh, accept, if not even contend with, in, in the future strategic competition. With that, I yield the floor. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Colonel Nicholson, I'm, I'm hoping that you're still on the line and you can offer your, your operational perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Well, well, thanks. And as a uh, Anu claimed to be the most junior, I'm definitely the least educated of this panel. So I will I will stick to the operational environment. Uh, I, I cannot compete when it comes to strategy. The the rest of the panel. So I'll talk operational. And uh, as mentioned during my introduction, I'm the deputy commander here in Alaska uh, for 11th Air Force. And, and Alaska is what makes the United States an Arctic nation. So we're very proud of that. Uh, in fact, we got about 16 inches of snow last night, and it is about 19 degrees right now. So. I think I'm probably the furthest, probably the furthest north and the coldest person right now. Uh, but operationally, the the decades ago, the the Arctic was a barrier, and really all the Arctic had to do for us for the defense of North America was to be icy and cold, and it did a very good job of that. Uh, and there was it was something that uh, was always, of course, a concern, but something that could be on the back burner because it was unlikely that those amphibious transports were going to come across the pole and, and land in the northern uh, part of Canada or the U.S. Uh, in fact, a, a while back. Uh, a Canadian general officer said that if enemy forces ever landed in North Canada, the first thing they'd have to do is rescue them. Uh, so it was a very dangerous, it's a very dangerous place and, and still is. However, now with the you know, climate change, things are more open and it's open to shipping. There, there is tourism, there is uh, resource extraction. Right now there is a moratorium on fishing, but there is a potential for fishing and things like that. And so whereas in the past, really Russian long range aviation was the big threat. And that's why we have a very extensive set of long range radar sites in Alaska. And we've been sitting alert here for decades and decades and decades. That was the big threat. Honestly, that's not the big threat anymore. The likelihood of Russian bombers coming over the pole and gravity bombing Washington DC 
with nuclear weapons is, is unlikely to happen. Uh, what's more likely to happen is what we see now are the developments of long range cruise missiles where uh, an enemy force, whether it be Russia, China, somebody else, doesn't even have to necessarily even leave their territory. They, that they can actually operate in a sanctuary area and threaten us with long range weapons. Uh, Cyber is a huge issue. The, the uh, infrastructure up here in Alaska is, is thin and it's old. Uh, we have as many roads as Vermont, uh, but we are 66 times its size, I think is the number someone told me. Um, the power system is very old or very reliant upon things like diesel generators, uh, just, just very, very thin infrastructure. And so cyber is always a, con a huge concern. Uh, special forces, and, you know, a lot of the gray zone type competition we talk about. So, so to kind of sum up, it's, it's, the Arctic has gone from a barrier that always protected us to really not so much of a barrier anymore. Definitely a very easy, a much, a very difficult place to operate, but a much easier place to operate than it used to be. Over. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I offer uh, this up to the, the rest of the panel um, regarding the last couple of decades, um, the strategic environment, what, what we observed, um, and then of course we're going to move to what we predict. But uh, are there any other panelists that have some thoughts? I open it up to you. If I may uh, just do a sound check, Amy, do you have me over? I've got you, yeah. Okay, just very quickly, the one thing that has changed significantly in the past two decades is the length of time that we and other nations have had to acquire data, knowledge, and research about the coupling of the Earth's surface, it's changing Earth's surface, to the atmosphere and space. And so with the launch of our Space Force, and of course, a lot of our threats now coming from uh, the, the space-based domain, that has been a significant game changer for us. And I did put it in the chat, but because of the Arctic's position on the planet, we, we often look at the Arctic as a region. The Arctic is a part of a planetary system and it, it's the singularly unique operational part of the planetary system. And that's something we often don't talk about. Over. I wanted to add to her comments because this is something that uh, uh, Dr. Ryan Burke and I have been trying to push for is the problem of people not realizing how important the Arctic is and even the Antarctic as well. And that's kind of why we've actually been broadening this Arctic stuff because uh, we see trend lines in Antarctica that have already happened in the Arctic that you can really at this point lump the two together because of the narratives and the belief that these places will not be militarized. But uh, to uh, the previous point though about space power, the future of space power, believe it or not, to the average policymaker is not aware of the fact that you actually need uh, infrastructure in the Arctic and Antarctic circle to support certain communication satellites in outer space. Uh, that's just a function of, uh, of the physics. And until you can get a person uh, you know, in Congress or National Security Council to realize that uh, the Arctic and Antarctic will continue just being ignored. And that's why, again, Dr. Ryan Burke and I are really big on pushing there needs to be an American polar pivot because the Russians began their polar pivot in 01 and the Chinese uh, began theirs in 2017. And the Chinese, the, the, the Chinese even actually view themselves increasingly through narratives as a near Antarctic state. And, and these are problematic this is very problematic, not just for the US, but for our allies, Antarctica and New Zealand, and they're aware of this. Out. Thanks, Doc, I appreciate that. Um, you, you actually opened it up uh, to, to where we're going, which is um, near and dear to my heart as an intelligence officer. Um, I'm always being asked, what do we think is going to happen? So um, this, this, I think, is gonna be an interesting question to all the panelists. So. Um, but I, I would start with, with Doc Matasek, actually. So, so what, what do we predict over the next two decades? What, what trends do you think we're going to see with regard to uh, the security environment, but, but also the strategic environment? You talked about a lot about infrastructure, um, but thematically, if you had thoughts on, on sort of what we predict over the next 20 years, uh, that would be great. Well, you're just going to see uh, the continuing of, of breaking uh, norms, laws, and, and sovereignty in, 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 at, at the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, and the Russians and Chinese will continue doing that like they're already doing now. 
because there hasn't been any actual uh, teeth to any policy or proclamations. Uh, and that is what Dr. Burke and I are like the most concerned about is we, you know, every once in a while, a congressman or a person uh, in the DOD will come out with like a strategy saying, hey, we actually need to take this more seriously. And then Congress says, hey, it's approved, but then the funding never actually comes through. Uh, and so that's the thing that, that we're really concerned about is that the Chinese and Russians continue to operate for the most part unopposed in both regions. And they're gonna increasingly contest uh, freedom of movement in the seas. They're gonna uh, increasingly see how much more infrastructure that looks like it's scientific, but is more military in nature to support uh, a constellation of uh, satellites. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see them trying to find ways to contest uh, American space power by virtue of saying if they can jam us in a, in a uh, possible future conflict or crisis scenario. And I would actually add more to Dr. Ryan Burke on this, if I can hand it off to him, because he, he can really get into the, into the weeds on this. Amy, just as a note, uh, Church has his hand up. Oh, sir, by all means, please. Well, yeah, I, I obviously, Dr. Mattis, I could try to hand off to Dr. Burke. I will try to just get a few uh, thoughts in before the Dr. Burke heads at it. And I'm sure we're probably, we're probably all kind of biting around the same apple on this, but strategically, two things I think are really important to understand. Number one, um, the, the fact that today, that you know, when we look at the military challenges in the Arctic region, it's of course about one set of challenges. The fact is that the Arctic is a very difficult region to operate, and along with other operators, I've, I've operated quite extensively in the Arctic region. And I certainly know that characterization of Arctic climate from a windscreen level is quite difficult and still quite an imperfect science. This aspect challenges all military operators, uh, friend and challengers. And in the same context, today we look at the Arctic region, the Arctic is, near, is a region where uh, what uh, has historically been a concern of uh, Russia of having the fact the Arctic was their frozen backstop and therefore as the, as the Arctic environment has changed, so too does the aspects that, that Russia's frozen backstop is now potentially an avenue of approach for uh, as from their fear-based um, you know, psychology. And so from our vantage point, uh, they've tried to put, uh, you know, to put forward the aspects I would, I would propose, I'd, say, I'd at least postulate that a, a, a good defense is positioning themselves for a strong offense and that having that capability along their our shorelines kind of squares with the psychology of, of a concern of, of outside in, of invasion from outside to include an Arctic Avenue of approach. When we look at the aspects of the Arctic from a, a, a non-Arctic nation vantage point, nations come to the Arctic region, not necessarily well, sorry, non-Arctic nations operate into the Arctic region, not necessarily well prepared for the physical environment which they're contending with. In the context of, of if you look at the Arctic as a resource region, which is one of, certainly one of the multinational sets of interests, and if you take a look at the interest of the PRC uh, into the Arctic region, they look at it from a vantage point of resources. How well prepared are they to actually try to extract resources, whether the petrochemical or marine life? Frankly, it's the reason where they're not necessarily well prepared to do well. And certainly when I look at their environmental success rates in other parts of the world, I'm very concerned about the influence they can have in a negative way, simply trying to do commercial development in the, in the Arctic region and quote the common spaces. So from my vantage point, when you look at the, the strategic challenges we see in the Arctic region, military is but one of them. And frankly, how do other nations come into the Arctic region to conduct resource extraction safely in a way that doesn't make a mess of the place so the, those of the Arctic nations themselves have to contend with that. So environmental concerns as far as part of the overall economic development equation is something to consider. Not every problem in the Arctic region is a nail that requires a hammer, but hammer is part of the solution set of dealing with all the challenges that, there, that we face in the region. So I'd offer those as some reflection, then yield the floor to, to Dr. Burke for his, his planned set of remarks, over. 
Thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, General Key. I appreciate that. And, and uh, to Colonel Madison's next point, there are really not a lot that I can expand upon with, with regard to those two points other than to simply underscore the fact that uh, I agree with everything that they've said. What I'll do is expand on that and say that the as far as the, the changes or excuse me, the, uh, the future that we're going to see in the Arctic, is really in in myself and Colonel Matasek's perspective, it, it really ties back again to what uh, what Colonel Matasek alluded to with regard to the norms and the laws. And we see this, and we admittedly see this from a different perspective than maybe even some of our, our fellow panelists. And I think that's what's so fascinating about this debate is there are, for, for me anyway, I'm speaking from my own perspective, there is a, what I'll refer to as a disquieting narrative emerging or that has been, that has prevailed with regard to Arctic security that, uh, that, that basically contends that the Arctic is again a zone of exceptionalism, a zone of peace that will maintain its status as such on the basis simply of global cooperation and motivated by norms and, um, and in some cases adherence or, or voluntary compliance with international law. I accept all of that on premise. Where I disagree with it and where I depart from my, from my colleagues who hold that opinion is when you look at the evolving, again, nature of the Arctic and the region for what it is and what General Key alluded to with regard to resources and extraction or extractive activities uh, with, with economies, in particular China, that has a voracious appetite that needs to maintain its, uh, its, its influence in a variety of different places to, to maintain its status in, in, in and of itself as a global power. There's all kinds of motivations for why states might pursue or converge on a on a frankly an ungoverned space, and when you look at the the ingredients for potential conflict again I'm not suggesting I'm not sitting here today in 2021 saying that we are going to see conflict in the Arctic in 2025 or 2045 or you name it right. But I'm not also, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop short of dismissing it outright as a possibility. Again, when you look at the overall ingredients for conflict, they are all there. They are all present. Uh, namely, the fact that, again, you've got an ungoverned space and the fact that in global commons, um, we have we know about competing claims and we don't have time to get into all the the details on the various competing claims around the uh, the arctic suffice to say that uh, even nato allies have competing claims right just because we're friends on one side of the table doesn't mean we're necessarily friends on the other side of the table so you've got these these two ingredients that are that are breeding tension as well as the fact that you have fractures, what I refer to as global covenants and contracts right if you will any of these international laws and and uh, and treaties that or forms in the sense of the Arctic Council that try to engage in cooperative measures, I think, again, we're starting to see more and more and more departures and more incentive for departures from these normative structures, such that there are nations that are willing to, willing to again, look at these things in their form, but ne not necessarily comply with them in their function. So it's a, real, it's a form function sort of argument with regard to what's actually going to maintain the Arctic stability. And I just, I simply disagree with the folks who, who continue to advocate for or reject the fact that there might never that there will never be Arctic conflict simply because of X, Y, and Z. And one of the reasons, and I'll, I'll shut up after this one comment, one of the common threads that we see beyond all the things that I just mentioned with regard to adherence to norms and global cooperation, one of the common threads that we see in the narrative about why states will not move into the Arctic and try to engage in some sort of, of aggressive um, extractive opportunity or excuse me, ex aggressive extractive sort of activity is because of this of the climate because of the environment because it is harsh because it's cold because it's dark right all of these things and again we don't reject that but at the same time. Look at what we've done right this is again that goes back to the original point states have operated in both polar regions for decades right for the preponderance of the 20th century and now moving into the 21st century states have operated in both polar regions technology has only gotten better our accessibility has only gotten better and our ability to sustain and project power into these regions has only gotten better yes it is really cold right negative 40 when you walk outside negative 40 degrees if that hits you that hits your heart right that that can that is an absolute slap in the face to uh, somebody who's never experienced it and when you try to stand out there for more than five minutes, if you don't have the proper gear, you're probably going to die, or at least you're going to work quickly toward that end. So I, I respect all these things, but at the same time, to suggest that states won't go up there simply because we we can't or because it's too cold, too dark, too far, I think fundamentally rejects the reality, the evolving reality of, of the military apparatus in, in most 
most great power states today and our ability to, uh, to, to operate in these, these uh, restrictive regions. Over. If there are any other panelists that would either like to respond to Doc Burke um, or, or offer their thoughts on, on what we predict over the next 20 years, there are a lot of comments uh, in, the, in the chat regarding uh, partnerships and, and how we're working with others in this region. Sir, I, I finally see your hand. Uh, I offer it up to you, uh, General, for your thoughts. Yeah, I, um, I guess, you know, perhaps this is, there's a need to be provocative for the sake of, because it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Um, strategically, though, I would challenge Dr. Burke on one aspect. I think that for all of us to see the Arctic region as a region of competition, it's a region where escalation is real. The potential of, of military escalation is a very real challenge. And, it, and if not done well, could actually real ha really happen. Is the reason that we the best way to deter and dissuade military escalation is to have a strong capability to demonstrate to those uh, nations that would challenge our interests and in, in essentially respective sovereignty between the United States, Canada, and our transatlantic uh, allies and partners to be capable to respond to exercise and posture and provide real capabilities, full spectrum that includes both hard and soft power in a way that ultimately signals in a way that this is not the day to try to tackle uh, the United States, Canada and allies and partners in the region. And that includes of course from a hybrid vantage point. So we need to look at the full spectrum and the fact is, is our deterrence measures taken seriously? So to me, if they're not, and then obviously then you go up the escalation ladder. There's also the aspect though, that folks that are in the Arctic region, uh, that are operating in the Arctic region, I do recognize the, the challenge of operating minus 40. It is really painful. And it is really also very humiliating those who don't take the time to prepare and to operate safely and smartly with the risk management protocols. That said, you know, the challenge I worry about a lot is our messaging as an alliance being received in a way that we intend and is the messaging on the other side uh, of our strategic competitors vantage point, and specifically when we're looking at the military challenges, being seen in a way to, to essentially go up the, end, the escalation ladder and to out escalate us in a way that causes the, the alliance to back down? Or is it done in a way that ultimately respects the fact that real power has real deterrent value? So, those are just some thoughts. Again, I, I think that we're probably uh, pretty close overall in our perspectives on this panel, but ultimately I do think that I would offer a balanced approach that does can take a look at whole of government solutions, but realizing that real investments are really important and they got to really demonstrate their capability to operate. Otherwise, deterrence is hollow. Respectfully submitted. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Frankie, did you have something? Yeah, I, I wanted to add to, uh, add to General Key's point was that that's, again, I think this is where we all are starting to aligning, aligning with agreement is Dr. Burks and I's point really about trying to get the American polar pivot to happen is having uh, capabilities and, uh, and personnel that are capable of actually operating in cold weather environments. Uh, I don't know if the average person knows this, but jet fuel, it freezes at negative 47 Celsius. Now there are special jet fuel blends like jet b uh jet b that it freezes around negative 72 because you add a uh you add a you do a mix of like gasoline and like kerosene but to that point until we actually start having vehicles and assets that can actually be sustainable in cold weather environments this is still just all talk and i don't want to go i i know there's a belaboring argument about should america even have icebreakers and to the, the, the bridge to that American polar pivot, and I think this is the importance of allies and partners that uh, Dr. Ryan Burke and I increasingly pound upon is like, look, if we're not gonna actually be serious about this, we need to be at least serious about empowering allies at the North Pole and also partners at, at the North Pole and also at the South Pole to pick up the slack and the, in, in the lack of enforcement and norms and laws in each region because China and Russia are gonna continue exploiting that until they get some pushback for once. Oh. 
I, I wanted to bring us back to some of the different narratives. So, uh, you know, Ryan and Frankie, those are those are really important things. And and uh, people like U.S. SOCOM, the Air Force, certainly USASOC and the U.S. Army uh, are making incredible leaps and bounds in terms of provisioning and outfitting and training. Uh, of course, those are narratives that restrict us to the traditional form. So the, the idea of governance and laws and the traditional forms of engagement in the Arctic, we're, we're talking about uh, new narratives. So what, what we see as changes, and I'm, I'm checking the chat, there is a lot of discussion about the science of the region as an integrated as an integrated region. So we have, um, I, I believe Doug uh, put in, uh, I think Doug Fraser put in the importance, for example, of the Canadian archipelago. While we have expended a great deal of, of effort and resources in Arctic science, believe it or not, that Arctic science is very deep, but very narrow. So we've invested essentially in the same science for the last 30 to 40 years. And I think that's something that has put us at a disadvantage in comparison, say, to the types of research that the Chinese have done. Certainly the Russians lead in terms of their knowledge of the Arctic environment, but to several of the points in the chat, that is really an assertion of their identity as an Arctic nation and the need to exploit the resources that they have control over uh, just to feed their people and uh, you know, project their power, which is a classically Russian thing to do. Thanks, Doc. Um, I'm, I'm going to continue with you if you don't mind, um, because uh, as far as where we're going, um, we're, we, the importance of research um, in this asymmetric, irregular, competitive, slash gray space, um, your views on, on the importance of, of research and, and we'll get other panelists after you're done. Yeah, thanks Amy. Of course, this is a area near and dear to my heart. I approach everything as a scientist and quite often the what I do is over the last 30 years, it's just how long I've been in this game, been tracking the types of research that our Chinese and our Russian academic colleagues have been doing. And we have certainly collapsed over the years into a very restricted set of research types. Uh, we expend an enormous amount of energy on you know, the governance side, the geopolitical side of things, a lot of the political science. The the areas, and of course, in the sea ice and uh, fisheries, the very, what, what I would call very traditional uh, old world uh, areas. And what I've seen with respect to the Chinese and certainly the Chinese primarily is that they have now pulled ahead in terms of Arctic research. So the breadth of what their research covers is, is astounding. This is reflected in the publication record. It's also reflected in the types of science that they're funding. For us to be truly competitive and unsurprised in the Arctic, unsurprised is really the key. We don't wanna be surprised there. We don't wanna be surprised in the traditional sense, kinetic sense. We don't wanna be surprised in any other way either. And that's sort of that asymmetric competition side. For us to not be surprised, we need to have a different narrative about the types of research we do in the Arctic from a defense and security perspective. That narrative is yet to be had. Um, and I won't, I won't have it here, but I wanted to offer that over. Thanks, Doc, I appreciate it. Um, other comments regarding uh, the importance of research um, and, and then sort of how that Im impacts where we're headed as, as a USG uh, in the strategic environment uh, as far as the Arctic. Amy, it looks like there's a question from, I think, uh, Omar, um, Amir. 
Uh, yes, thank you for having me on the panel, Doc. Uh, I just wanted to ask that with the increasing competition in the Indo-Pacific, do you believe that it is viable to uh, expand the resources in the Arctic region? Because uh, I believe the future conflicts are more likely to take place in the Indo-Pacific rather than in the Arctic or the South Pole, the Antarctic region. Thank you. Amy, um, see, uh, the uh, discussion so far, what I could make out has obviously uh, focused on the militarization of the Arctic region. So we cannot say that the region is not militarized and we can um, uh, see there is not going to be conflict in the Arctic region, but this is one thing we cannot rule out with Russia's um, uh, attempts of militarizing the region and China, uh, China's attempt in and gaining influence in this region and their uh, strategic uh, partnership uh, related to transit route and connectivity uh, and uh, NSR uh, transit route in this region. Definitely, there are going to be struggle. There are going to be geopolitical struggle. But I agree with Amir. Uh, Indo-Pacific is another hot uh, region. Uh, where the conflicts are bound to happen. But we cannot ignore that uh, Arctic will not become the theater of conflict. Arctic to some extent has been the theater of struggle and conflict between uh, the Arctic state and now the non-Arctic state. So I just wanted to mention this, that the narrative has changed from the old times that uh, before the struggle used to be between the Arctic states, but now the non-Arctic states are also the part of this struggle. So there is a struggle related to influence in this region. Thanks, Anu, I appreciate that. Um, are there any other thoughts regarding the militarization of the region um, and then how that's uh, playing into some of our commitments as far as financially going forward? Um, uh, Omar's question was specifically regarding resources um, and, and we're talking about research and how that's gonna impact the way forward. Um, are there any other panelists that have thoughts on the subject? Amy, if I could throw it to church in Bulldog, we've talked for years about the connectivities of the Arctic to the Indo-PACOM region. So I'll, I'll throw it to them. Well, uh, thanks for the tee up on that, Doc. I do see there's a remark from Tom or a hand up from Tom Connolly. So let me reflect and then see what uh, Tom would like to offer. Um, number one, the Arctic is a region, of course, where multiple nations in the Pacific have an interest, frankly, and it's probably mostly from a, a vantage point of resources but it also is potentially a future transportation route because ultimately the end of the day, one, one aspect of transportation from markets in East Asia to Europe through a transpolar route does save a lot of time. And if you look at the aspect of more Arctic warming and an, an increasingly open route, and I'm not talking specifically about the Northern Sea route, which has its unique challenge of simply of just being charged a toll uh, by the Russian Federation to transit, but the idea that if, if the Arctic continues on the current trajectory, then we're only a few, you know, perhaps a decade or so away from at least a part of the year of being able to do transpolar navigation from East Asian to European markets. Uh, interest so in the Indo-Pacific region in the Arctic is, again, transportation, it is resources. And at the end of the day, there are access routes to the Bering Straits. Uh, principally. And then if you look at this, the uh, the importance of that region is a confined water space uh, and relatively shallow in, in an area that does have its own unique set of uh, maritime hazards is how do you do this in a way that doesn't put at risk their investment activities. But I do think the Indo-Pacific, uh, where you're seeing the, the, the most of the, you know, the new economic engines on the planet do provide an area they, they look north because it's in their national interest from an economic vantage point and it fuels their engines. So to me, the, the ability for us to work with Indo-Pacific nations that are on good terms with us, with, if you will, the, the Arctic nations that uh, are have within the NATO and, uh, and, and NORAD alliance, uh, there is in our interest to try to find a way for them to operate in the region safely, smartly, in a way that doesn't create, again, economic our environmental problems based on their economic interest. And again, so you look at the Arctic as there's a full slate of, of needs to prepare to take care of 
uh, again, a myriad of interest in the reason military being one and of course a significant part of that. Uh, Bulldog, I give the floor to you and then we probably need to go see what uh, Tom Connolly has up, uh, up his sleeve. Thank you, sir. And I'll, and I'll be super, super brief. I was just going to say that with the the way we see here in Alaska, or at least in 11th Air Force, with the reduction in sea ice and the, and the increased warming up here in the north, the uh, the Arctic Ocean is just a north North Pacific now. So we don't really see it as two separate areas. Uh, the Bering Strait is just a way to get from one part of the Pacific up to you know, the northern Pacific, up to the North North Pacific, the Arctic Ocean. So we see it as one, as one contiguous um, ocean area. Over. Yeah, that's, uh, can you hear me? We can, thanks, sir. Okay, all right. It still shows that I'm muted, can you hear? Okay, can you hear me now? Thanks, Doc. Uh, yeah, uh, Colonel uh, Nicholson kind of stole a little my, uh, my thunder there, but uh, one of the things that we have to remember uh, is that from the Arctic, uh, especially uh, America, uh, uh, far west North America and into Alaska, the supply chain network of being able to supply all the way down to Asia is easier to do with the landed countries uh, along the regions all the way to the south, as opposed to trying to go across the ocean because we are a globe. And it's, it's safer that we can stage material down into the Indo-PACOM area along the chain of friendly countries down into that region. And with reconciliation, maybe uh, we will have an American base back in the Philippines that can serve as a hub. But one of the things that uh, uh, many have said, uh, it, it is a short hop into Europe from Alaska over the Arctic Circle. And in the 80s, we proposed the Army uh, proposed, along with the Air Force, these super uh, military bases that could run divisions level size training events and have these huge open areas for fire and maneuver, staging huge numbers of troops, because putting them on aircraft and getting them into Europe would only take a few hours as opposed to 12 to 16 hours from bases in the continental United States. And it was highly militarized. And then we pulled back. It wasn't because of it's hard to work up there. Uh, we pulled back because monetarily we didn't see any strategic value in doing so. And so I think we're kind of locked into a paradigm of where is our next real threat coming from? And is the threat really going to come from Russia over the Arctic Circle? And I think we're missing out on this is the new supply route. A lot of our ships cannot, as we see in California, the supply lines hitting the United States are bogged down. A lot of these huge ships cannot get through the Panama Canal anymore. Going down to Tierra del Fuego is extremely dangerous. But Following up those areas up through Japan, refueling, and then through the Arctic Circle makes sense economically as safer shipping. And we're going to see a, a actual competition, economic competition uh, in this area. And we're looking at our new strategy, our new theory of success, our new theory of victory, which uh, we're trying to figure that out before it was containment. And then we kind of lost sight of what, what, what is success for American strategy, military strategy, or foreign policy? What does success look like? And so now we're talking about competition. We're talking about rivalry. We're talking about denial. We're, we're, we're coming up with all these catchphrases, but yet we have yet to really figure out what do you want us to do and what is the goal you want us to deny Russia and uh, China access to areas? Do you want us to compete with them in areas? Or do you want us to actually engage in conflict in areas? And so until that is specified, we're gonna be kind of uh, spinning our wheels, like uh, 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 Dr. Frankie said, of what is it we're gonna do? 
And I, and I think that's really where we're, we're stuck at right now. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, right. to, to Bulldog Kelly's point, I'm glad he brought that up about the Arctic and, and the history of, of how the military has thought about it. Uh, it reminds me of a trip I just did to Ukraine where I was interviewing Ukrainian government military officials and how they all said before 2014, we had no defense posture or assumption the Russians would ever violate our sovereignty, salami, slice a part of our country, you know, uh, uh, you know essentially have a, a, a fait accompli. And the reason why I throw out that analogy is the fact that that seems to be where the U.S. is in terms of thinking of the Arctic is, again, it's the assumption of nothing will ever happen. We really don't need to have much of a posture there. Uh, you know, the Russians will respect the law and the sovereignty, all those things like that. And yet the Russians already did that in Ukraine. They violated the 94 Budapest memorandum that the reason why Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons was a guarantee of sovereignty from the Russians and the West. And, you know, 20 years later, that, that thing meant nothing. Uh, and that's what really has Dr. Burke and I concerned is the fact that we like to have these assumptions. And yet right now, China and Russia are operating with the assumptions of they can basically slowly keep a, a salama slice salami slicing and breaking these these rules laws and norms and keep getting away with it and that's that's what i think is the most dangerous thing thanks chuck i appreciate it um before i'm even more rude i would offer, <laughs> i asked tom Connolly if you do have a question um feel free to throw in thanks everybody um uh, it's been a really interesting discussion so far um i just have a two-parter that kind of builds on dr burke's and dr Matisic's sort of uh article and arguments and discussing a polar pivot um in a, in a perfect world with you know full uh you know, congressional support how would you guys like to see that pan out like how would that logistically work in a legislative and logistical sense um and also being based in Australia myself, I'm curious about what your opinions are. I know you touched on it earlier, but I'd love if you could expand on it a little more and like what the role of regional partners would be, like i.e. Australia in the Antarctic or Canada in the uh, Arctic. Thank you. Yeah, Frankie, I'll jump in on that one. The, uh, it's a great question, Tom. Thank you. So the, the first part about the legislative aspect of it, it's a huge huge web to unpack and uh, we, we recognize the realities of this, right? It, it, this is, that's the one nice thing about being an academic, right? Is hopefully this makes people chuckle, but I can sit back and type all sorts of stuff on my computer, having done the research, having talked to the experts and I can make suggestions. And then it's up to the folks that are really have the big brains that are making the policies, developing the strategies to look at and say, this is garbage and toss it or say, yeah, you know what, maybe there's an idea here. Let's see what we can do to actually implement it. So that's that's the freedom that I have as an academic that we all collectively have as academics. Um, and we recognize that, right? It, it's uh, it's not as easy as we make it seem when we write our articles and, and we give our talks and, and we, we know that, right? So all that to say, um, what I think would be ideal, right, in terms of in terms of executing a, a broader polar pivot, recognizing the realities that that uh, Colonel Matisek and I certainly feel about the future of the polar regions writ large, but in particular the Arctic, for the sake of this conversation, uh, I'd like to see more. Um, for lack of a better term, uh, more balancing. And I, I don't know if anybody, if we have an international security scholars in the room, uh, but if you take a, a basic class in International Relations 101, right, you're going to hear all about this idea of balancing and, and all these scholars that have created this idea over the over many years. And there's many offshoots of the theory. And, and so, but balancing collectively is the idea where states amass military or economic power to maintain a, a basis of order, right? Preserve a balance of power to use the actual uh, scholarly lingo. And I think, and this is again, my, my own personal assessment, whether it's shared with anybody else, I don't know. I think it's probably open to discussion. I do not think that the United States being the global hegemon as, that it is, I think we are entering into a, a bipolar, certainly with China, if not even a multipolar world, where the United States is no longer sitting at the top playing king of the hill. And, and we, we as the United States need to recognize this evolving reality 
We need to stop with the liberal hegemony narrative that we have been presiding over for the better part of the last 75 years and, and understand and recognize that we cannot, we cannot order the Arctic. We cannot create order in the Arctic because we simply cannot facilitate that level of balancing. It just there's simply not going to be the, the case. What I believe is that the United States should should backpedal a little bit and say, yep, yeah, you know what, the Arctic is important. We need to certainly maintain our vigilance right from a homeland defense perspective. That's, uh, I think, General Key and, and some others have mentioned that already. I underscore that point. This is absolutely a, a major issue for U.S. Uh, security interests is, is defending the homeland. It's really a, a principal pillar of every national security strategy that we've had for the better part of the last three decades. Um, but beyond that, so recognizing that reality, we need to defend the homeland, but that's not necessarily through power projection and, uh, and getting into the Arctic by way of, of being there just to be there. I think uh, Frankie and I laid out a couple of suggestions in the article that, uh, that are more feasible that we as a U.S. military could do to, again, project that power to maintain a presence of some kind to show that we are committed to the Arctic, like General Key mentioned with regard to our deterrent effect. Uh, we certainly do need to do those things and we need to maintain engagement with our partners and our allies. There's a lot of things here that the U.S. can do to pivot to these polar regions, in particular the Arctic, uh, but ultimately it's to preserve order because I, I don't think that the U.S. can preside over the Arctic and and call the or make the uh, make the rules and call the shots, if you will. I don't believe they can. So I think we need to recognize that reality and we need to strive for balance and we need to strive for, in some sense, um, a obviously we want to prevent conflict, right? Nobody's advocating for a, a conflict environment, but uh, I think the United States needs to pull back and realize that there may be some transactional opportunities with Russia. There may be some transactional opportunities with China. Uh, and then down for for uh, Australia, in particular in the Antarctic, we certainly see the the Aussies as a as a vital partner, if not even an ally depending on uh, on where that moves to in the next 15 20 years and there's a lot to unpack there but i don't want to derail this conversation away to the uh to the south pole either so uh with that i'm happy to to reattack if anybody has any any challenges or comments but uh, with that I'll, I'll stop running my suck and turn it over to maybe frankie if you have anything to, to evolve from there no i mean i i, I think dr ryan burke hits it i mean hits out of the park with that i mean that's why his book the polar pivot is coming out in a few months that like gets into the details and the weeds on this. Um, but, you know, what does this look like from a policy, you know, from an explicit policy perspective? It means uh, we, we probably need to have a, a dozen icebreaker ships. We probably need to field uh, units that are, that we call cold weather units. I mean, but like the Russian military has basically made their own version of an Arctic military command uh, and it, it basically means us having to at least make it look like we're willing to, you know, oppose the Russians as they continue to get closer and closer to that, that red line. If the U S even has a red line in the Arctic. And that's what I think that's, what's so problematic right now is what, what else is Russia going to start doing, especially when, when the Chinese basically have a, you know, a, a, a deal over what they're going to do up there from what we can tell, um, is that, you know, they're going to keep doing this unopposed. And if we have no cold weather power uh, projection abilities that we can show be a uh, sustained and capable, then they're just going to keep exploding, you know, uh, exploiting that, uh, that loophole uh, in the U S military. So that's all I have to say about that. I appreciate that. Um, we're, we're talking a lot about um, what we should do and, and what, direction we should take at this and bulldog you mentioned this in your comments you know what what do you what do you want us to do um, and so I, I'm gonna pitch the next question um, to general key and, and Dr. Alessa because um, I, I think it's going to, to get to the heart of, of both sides of, of that issue and that and uh, uh, Amy yes before you go on uh, Kyle Martison I've been yes. scrolling around he has his hand up uh, I think he has a question. Kyle, go ahead. Uh, all right. I'm encouraged to be creative by my overlord. So I don't want to sound too, too ridiculous. And I feel like the answer is China's belligerent. They're going to keep being belligerent. And there's nothing we can do about it. But, um, you know, I was thinking about the, the whole Central Asian Snow Leopard Agreement, right, which is pretty successful from what I understand. And if we started phrasing some of like conservative 
legislative bills just to at least draw attention to the polar regions and then sneak stuff in there, you know, about like sonar usages, things that damage whale brains and stuff like that. Is that one of those things you think we can trick some of our adversaries to falling for and signing up for? And if that would just be a building block to further negotiations or uh, is this just all whale wars recycled? That's a great question. No, I appreciate that. Um, regarding getting getting our adversaries on <laughs> in line with that, does anyone on the panel have any thoughts? Or Bulldog, if you have any thoughts. Uh, I uh, am, am I back on? I seem to be. There we go. Now I know I'm back on. Uh, using. Uh, I don't want to use the overturn whole of government, but using interagency planning and policies and going to Congress and getting legislation passed that has a national security flavor to it that we can use as basis of uh, agreements with our allies or even our adversaries could be useful. We, we've, we've seen this uh, with adversaries where uh, we have used uh, international aid, uh, such as in North Korea in 2003, where I was one of a small team that went to North Korea after the train derailed uh, and uh, uh, participated and assist in the coordination of the cleanup. Uh, we've had U.S. aid and dark teams in Iran after an earthquake, which then has led to some uh, basic uh, go-betweens using uh, Sweden. Um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, no, using Switzerland, I apologize. Uh, and so there is a possibility that if we can reduce a lot of the, uh, you know, 75,000 feet concepts and get them down into something that is planable, that we can use as a working foundation to counter some of the militarization of the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, because countries' cl claims of the Antarctic overlap each other, which could cause conflict in the future. That is a possibility. The, the question is, until we understand what our nation's security strategy is, while it's being written right now, and what our actual foreign policy goals are, from the State Department and from the administration, the NSC, uh, we, 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 we can banter around a lot of stuff, but we're not gonna be able to truly move forward and develop operational uh, activities that can be implemented. And, that, and that's really where we are with this. Uh, we look at the illegal fishing, uh, how that's fed in now over into AFRICOM. We can look at uh, what the Chinese are doing uh, that they signed people up to do stuff, and now they're reneging on it. And these people that had signed their their economies away to the Chinese are now not happy. But there's no alternative. So I, I think there's a lot there we can do. Uh, but unless we really know what our our national security strategy is going to be, and what our foreign policy goals are going to be, other than we're going to compete with them. Uh, that's that's not really a goal. It's just an activity. So that's where I'm stuck at. Thanks. No, I, I appreciate that insight, definitely. Um, I see Rich Bamante's hand, if you have anything that you'd like to add or, or a question. Well, nothing, nothing to add to that. It's hard to follow the question on the whales, but uh, I I definitely had, a, I had some questions uh, if I could. Um, you know, we, we've, talk, we've talked about NATO and, and, and kind of the, some of the concerns of transatlanticism and, and, and NATO concerns. And we talked about the Arctic uh, in terms of Alaska and supply chain into the Indo PACOM, but we, nobody's really touched on Greenland yet. And I, I put up a few questions earlier in there, but you know, to me, if, you know, if the region were a room, Greenland would be that you know, proverbial big white elephant that's stuffed in there. And, and so 
you know, I think I've got two questions. One, really, my, my first one, if I can just get them both out and maybe I'll ask, but my first one is uh, really uh, for, Ma for Major General Key in particular, but I'd also appreciate comments from other panelists. And how do you see the significance of Truly Air Base, for instance, in Greenland increasing as, a, as great power competition heats up in the Arctic? And then two, my follow-on question to that is, as Greenland increasingly seeks independence, yet remains kind of both militarily and economically dependent on Denmark. Uh, we're taking more of a, you know, diplomatic role in, in, in engaging, you know, the, the, the uh, self-rule government of Greenland, yet we still have a, you know, strong, obviously, tie to Arctic Commando and, and Danish MOD. So how does, how does the panel view that self-rule government of Greenland's role in Arctic strategy as commercial interest in Greenland increase and, and, and our own interest in, uh, in that region increases? Thank you. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Does anyone on the panel have any thoughts regarding that? I, I do, Amy. I'm going to take a bite of the apple here and obviously um, defer to my colleagues as they'd like to add for the comment. Strategically, of course, um, Greenland is a critical part of the Arctic region uh, from a security vantage point, from an economic vantage point as well. Uh, the decreasing ice shelf. Uh, in the uh, on on the Greenland on Greenland itself is diminishing quite rapidly. Um, today, if you look at uh, the exposed shorelines, essentially that where the ice sheets have retreated from, we're approaching to some vantage point. If you look at the historical context, about the time of when uh, Norse uh, Norse uh, peoples had inhabited southern Greenland, we're getting about to the point where they were able to where they what they found in around 800 AD. And the reality is that uh, they're able, in, in ancient times, if you will, uh, establish a, an economy that allowed grazing and uh, essentially European style farming and agricultural aspects that lasted for about a, about a 350 year period. And it got too cold for them to continue. And ultimately, they were not able to sustain that sort of, that sort of European style uh, agriculture pursuits. And therefore, they had to leave and or they died off. Um, if you look at today, of course, uh, Greenland as ice sheets uh, continue to, you know, uh, lose a lot of volume and land mass, uh, you're seeing, of course, the opportunity for uh, what Greenland's, what many people say is the opportunity for Greenland's mineral wealth to be more readily accessed, in particular rare earth minerals. Certainly, if you look at uh, Beijing's perspective, they were trying to continue, I think, corner of the globe global market on rare earth minerals, and therefore they have strategic interest in seeing what they can acquire in Greenland uh, for mining rights. I think right now that, uh, you know, appreciative of the fact that the Kingdom of Denmark is, is maintaining a, a very sort of strong control on, on getting international mining interests uh, involved in Greenland uh, resource extraction. I do think that uh, when you look at the bases such as uh, Tule Air Base, it is a critical aspect of, of essentially space control for the United States. And I'll go further than that on this kind of level conversation, but Julie is a very important part of our national defense enterprise, specifically look at the areas of space warning and space control. I do think that frankly, our, our the Kingdom of Denmark, uh, our military allies within the Alliance that have their Danish Arctic Command there in Nuuk and certainly maintain a, a, a sovereign control for the Kingdom and ultimately the people therein. Uh, on behalf of the, their, their national interests, and that really complements, of course, the alliance. I do think that, frankly, we uh, we need to continue to invest uh, in that partnership, that alliance. Uh, the, the Danish Air Command uh, there was just previously was the, the Danish uh, defense attaché to the United States. So certainly someone who understands the, uh, the U.S. perspective, and certainly I would consider a friend and partner for thinking through the challenges, both from the hard and soft power vantage point. When you look at today, of course, uh, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland reflect essentially the North American Arctic. And we do need a whole of essentially hemisphere approach in thinking through how we uh, dissuade and deter and ultimately better uh, protect our respective sovereign interest under an alliance construct. I think that looking at this from from a, from a series of thought leaders and looking at what are some real protective measures we've done, because it is, is a largely ungoverned space. 
Um, but there are military capabilities to secure, protect, and defend. And ultimately, you also need to think about the safety and security vantage point from a law enforcement vantage, so essentially making sure that people that are doing commercial interests are doing so safely and smartly. So a whole of government, whole society approach that ultimately does invest are the people who live in Greenland, who have a, have a yearning to have greater self-control and self-determination, realizing though that still Greenland is a part of the kingdom of Denmark and their national sovereignty uh, while having more self-control, uh, self-governance is still maintained by Copenhagen. And so therefore the United States approach should be working of course, principally through Copenhagen, but then also in a collaborative and complementary approach with the self-determination aspects there in, in Nuke. So I'd offer those as some reflections. It's a great conversation. And I'd like to pause with that though for now. So I think that the question is very important because Greenland and Svalbard, but Greenland especially is a little bit of an elephant in the room. Uh, it is uh, certainly a significant piece of land from a strategic positioning point of view. It is from a resource point of view. It is also because there are several things happening at different scales. As General Key pointed out, there is a tug of war between self-governance, determination, and the Kingdom of Denmark. Of course, many of the amenities and services there uh, sustained by Denmark, but the identity strongly Inuit, Greenland Inuit. Um, Canada, so I originally came from the Canadian side, those internal struggles, struggles of identity can often go either way. However, the influence of China in Greenland is also something we don't discuss from a granular perspective. We often, again, talk in the geopolitical, the you know, international affairs, the international policy aspects, but understanding where the, the pressure points are in Greenland with respect to who is influencing whom can help us understand how we engage, as General Key said, how we engage both parties. Engaging the Kingdom of Denmark as an ally is, is critical. There is simply no way around that. And engaging the indigenous peoples throughout the Arctic is also critical. Uh, but there has to be a balance because even in Indigenous communities, when the identity as an Indigenous Arctic person uh, is asserted, there is also the wisdom to realize that they are part of a more global community, a more global society. With respect to the, the physical environment of Greenland in our space space domain or space-based assets, the influence of that on the Indo-Pacific cannot be understated. And a lot of people don't make that connection. It is simply because of the sheer size of this piece of geology and homeland that that influence can extend so far. As uh, Mr. Kelly said, the when you start, and, and as uh, Colonel Nicholson said, when you start looking at the Indo-Pacific and the Arctic and then the continental Europe and the rest of the Northern Hemisphere, everything shrinks. So when we look at a map and we see Greenland and we look at the Indo-Pacific, we say, no way, too far away. But when you look at the systems, so the geophysical systems, when you look at them that way, everything shrinks down and those distances and influence and implications and consequences shrink in proportion inversely. So they become very significant. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. And, and sorry, did we have someone who would like to add? You mean real quick, I'll, I'll uh, mention yeah. Greenland. So this is again, to go back to the historical piece of it, I love the question because the question is, is indicative of of strategic foresight, right? We're looking at what are the opportunities because again, territory, land, right? This is it, all these things we are talking about. If if we as a United, as a uh, as a country, as the United States, understand there's other folks from other countries on this call, but from a United States perspective, if we have any intent 
or inclination that, that uh, we think we are going to be an Arctic power moving forward, it requires territory. And Alaska in and of itself is probably not going to be enough. If you look at the Russian, uh, the Russian posture on the other side, right, or some of our colleagues have called it the, the ice curtain. Uh, I, I personally believe that Greenland is one of the most strategically important pieces of land on the planet. If we're looking at just purely from the Arctic perspective and understanding and in, in deference to the uh, um, the Inuit population and the locals and understanding that it's an autonomous island within the Kingdom of Denmark, all the things that my colleagues have already mentioned, these things don't still don't detach us from the fact that Greenland is, I think it, it was 1947, Time Magazine had an article that said uh, that they, they referred to Greenland as the largest aircraft carrier in the world. And the, the implications of this are, are enormous. When you think about, again, a, a future military, strategic or security environment requires presence to be influential right presence equals influence and if we want to be influential we need to be present if we want to be present we need to be in or around greenland and Thule air force base being a major hub or it will be in in the future probably of arctic operations i think beyond that we've got a uh, we've got an lz lz raven down in uh, i think south central greenland that we we do some uh, some training on with the 109th they go down there and, and do some of their um, uh, their ice training or their ice landing um, but beyond that, right, this is, Greenland is something that I think the United States, I think the, the broader population here, we just tend to forget how much the United States has been interested in Greenland over the last 70 plus years. It'd go back to 1941 in the Defense of Greenland Agreement, right? And then we revised it and we signed another uh, version of it in 1951 that allowed us essentially to militarize the, the island. These, these are all things that, and the United States, we forgot when, uh, when Trump back in August of 2019 said that he wanted to purchase Greenland, the media absolutely thrashed him and said, what a ridiculous suggestion, but then how quickly we forget I think it was 1946 that the Truman administration tried to do the same damn thing. So the United States, and they're, they're fascinating quotes. When you dig into the archives on this, they're fascinating quotes on, on, the, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff and our collective military interest in Greenland from, from the 1940s all the way through to carry through to 2019 to 2021. Greenland has been a constant, as far as the United States is concerned, from a purely geostrategic perspective. It's not going to go away. Greenland absolutely matters. And, and if I had my druthers, if I were advising uh, folks doing this stuff, I would say we need to really pay attention to Greenland moving forward and understanding all the other things that, that go into um, the restrictions on, uh, on what we can and can't do. I understand all these things, right? But there are still things that, uh, that the United States can, can engage in and the conversations that we absolutely can and should be having with regard to our presence in and on Greenland over the uh, next, well, the next chapter of this uh, evolving complex environment. Over. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm going to throw my anchor backwards into uh, the indigenous people's discussion that Doc Alessa um, brought up because I, I think that's something that we've had a couple of questions in the feed about it. Um, I, I, Doc I, Alessa, I'm curious uh, when we're talking about a strategic space, and, and I know, General Key, you, you've mentioned that this is going to be central to the Ted Stevens Center, um, at least in the studies perspective. Um, when we're talking about indigenous peoples and, and getting them involved and where they where we see them in the strategic sense, um, Doc, Alyssa, I'm really interested to know your thoughts on that. Thanks, Amy. So this is something that is very personal to me. I, I grew up in a non-Western community, a subsistence-based community, and there is often the narrative of the separation of the indigenous peoples, sometimes even as museum pieces. We talk about the indigenous way of life and we talk about the subsistence way of life as something that needs to be preserved. But if you look at the adaptation, the adaptive capacity of indigenous peoples globally, but in the Arctic particular, because of the huge swings in the, the environment that occurred, the Arctic was once a warm, shallow sea. So it was fringed with tropical plants. It had a variety of flora and fauna, mastodons that roamed grasslands. The indigenous peoples retain the knowledge of that adaptive capacity. And a lot of communities do see themselves as globalized communities. So in that globalization, uh, we, we often think of the indigenous peoples as somehow up and, and uh, I, don't, I don't know, shivering in igloos maybe, I'm not sure. But in reality, they are savvy scientists, business people, 
um, participants in the global economy and in the global political scene. But to Ranjita's point, there is also a set of assumptions that are often imposed upon us. It's, it's a set of assumptions that, I, I love that green colonialism, it's a set of assumptions that are done sometimes and often with the best of intentions. But in terms of a changing strategic space, a lot of Indigenous communities are also enormous patriots. Now, it doesn't matter what country you come from. They love their country, they understand their country, and the region of that country better than most people, most of their fellow citizens. So the desire to participate in the security of the Arctic is, is often quite high, but we often relegate them to, um, you know, going out and talking about their subsistence needs, which is absolutely critical. I, I actually watched uh, my grandmother be the last of the people who 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 were, was able to do that, but also embrace the future. So I think from a strategic operating space perspective, we most certainly need to engage Indigenous communities. Now I'm going to go out on the limb here and say something that is certainly I intend it to be thought provoking. I would offer that if we restrict indigeneity to race and not place, then we miss the beauty of that globalization in our indigenous communities. We need to respect and embrace as partnerships, not as isn't that nice, but as a partnership, the indigenous identity, cultures and the ways of knowing, which is a different kind of approaching science. At the same time, we need to understand that it, if you have a locality and an intimacy with a locale, the contribution of that knowledge, that local place-based knowledge to improving a nation's strategic posture and stance and their ability to acquire information about the changes that will impact any kind of operation whether it be search and rescue, whether it be humanitarian, or whether it be defense, will be lost. So engaging communities for their local and place-based knowledge as partners, not as a place to go get the information and use it, is going to be, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, is going to be the critical piece to understanding environmental changes at very fine local scales. I apologize, that was quite long. I am very passionate about it, thanks. I appreciate your comments, Doc. And uh, from a SOCOM perspective, understanding place-based expertise uh, and indigenous cultures, um, very central to special operations forces globally um, and certainly in this region. So um, definitely appreciate that uh, perspective. Um, if there are anybody, any other uh, panelists or, or um, that have any thoughts on indigenous uh, perspectives in the strategic environment. And, and sir, I, I see your hand, so go ahead. I'll be quick. Uh, just two specific reflections. Number one, I heartily agree with Dr. Les on this. We, she and I have been working and thinking about this topic and this, this mission space for a long, long time. And the second thing I'd offer is that when you think about the Arctic you know, local and place-based uh, knowledge community, there is a place for Arctic indigenous people have been in the land since time again. And so frankly, that that needs to be considered and certainly needs to be integrated. These, the, the communities in the Arctic region and looking from the North American Arctic, but also looking, looking from the vantage point of our transatlantic uh, allies and partners, uh, that local place-based knowledge that includes and, you know, people who have their genetic origins to that region has tremendous value to be integrated, uh, not an applique to the security equation, respectfully submitted. No, thanks, sir. And and I'm certainly taking my prompting from from the chat section. Um, so so um, are we in need of a new narrative? And and I agree with Bulldog Kelly. Uh, a lot depends, of course, on on what we're going to be asked to do. But um, I I would like to start um, with Doc Alessa and then kind of move through the panel very quickly. Do we need a new narrative? And and where should that face? Not necessarily what should it include, but uh, where should it face? Um, and we'll use up the rest of our time with that. Uh, go ahead, Doc. 
I'll make it very short, Amy. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, Lieutenant Commander Bruce is also in the thick of these issues uh, in terms of the new narrative. Yes, we desperately need a new narrative. The narrative we're currently on is important and it must continue. At the same time, we need a new narrative that expands, opens the aperture to include more precise, evidence-based, data-driven interpretations of scenarios so that we can plan for the future. Thank you, over. Thanks, Doc, I appreciate it. Um, we'll go to Doc Burke next. So I'm sure I'm on mute. Um, Short answer, yes, I, I, I agree. I think that uh, one thing to, to follow up on, it's one thing that I'm, I've said openly and uh, I'm not, it's not taken well and I understand that. I understand how it's perceived by a lot of folks, but I think it's it's nonetheless a reality to, to kind of tie up this, this last piece on the indigenous. Um, lending voice to indigenous and or non-state actors is a privilege of peacetime. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't. I mean, we absolutely, for all the reasons that the panel has already discussed, we absolutely need to continue our engagements with indigenous populations. It absolutely must be the case. But it, what I don't want us to lose sight of is the fact that if, if, it's a big if, if we go down the, the rabbit hole of conflict and we start to emerge into a situation where the Arctic becomes a much more pressing challenge than it currently is today, where we see active conflict, these things may not be the first, these things, these conversations may not be the first thing that the United States pursues, is, is just all I'm going to say. And I think that's a reality that unfortunately has crept up in multiple conversations I've had with policymakers, with, with strategists, um, and with a lot of folks that would be at the, at the proverbial tip of the spear doing the execution. And uh, it's, it's just an unfortunate reality of the environment that we do live in. And we need to frankly find ways to avoid that. We need to find ways to make sure we integrate and do the things that we know we should do and seek that, that local knowledge. But at the same time, I don't see it as being the, the first among uh, many priorities that the United States is going to pursue. So um, long-winded answer, I wanted to just tie off the, the comment on that. Yeah, we need a new narrative, bottom line. And I don't know how much more I can say that, that hasn't already been said in the panel. Uh, I think again, to underscore my final point, we have, I think we need to detach ourselves from this Arctic apathy narrative that uh, the Arctic is a, a cold, dark and far place that we will never see conflict in. I'm not suggesting that we that we will, but we certainly might. And I think it's it's dangerous, if not even apathetic, strategically apathetic to dismiss the Arctic as relevant to these strategic conversations simply because it is far away and simply because people think it's too damn cold to operate up there. I just, I fundamentally reject that. So yeah, we need to pay attention for sure. Over. No, thanks, Dr. Rick. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Matasek, if you have anything uh, on your perspective, uh, do we need a new narrative regarding Arctic security and uh, where should it face? I mean, so this is, again, uh, I think this is what I think is cool about Dr. Burke and I being a part of this is <clears throat> uh, not only do we need a new narrative for the Arctic, we need a new narrative for the Antarctic. Um, and it also does involve indigenous peoples globally um, Partly because we just know that sea level rise is going to continue, like like the warming in the Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle is going to continue. Um, Ryan Berg and I actually like a, had a really fascinating conversation with a, a New Zealand author who was talking about like the problem he sees of affecting him in New Zealand people, uh, you know, in that region is you know those small you know those small island countries that are basically going to disappear. Um, and that's going to become a huge climate refugee crisis. And, I, you know, you're also just going to see like the indigenous way of life going to change in the Arctic Circle. Um, so I guess my only real big hope out of this is that the next time we hold something like this, we're not calling it the Arctic, you know, the Arctic strategy. It's the polar strategy. And uh, to even like to like the Ted Stevens Center, I'd, I'd like to in the next five, 10 years, it's called like the Ted Stevens Polar Polar Center, because we're going to have to acknowledge the harsh reality that the Antarctic is going to become a problem. Uh, the Chinese are already trying to create a narrative of Antarctic, you know, like that it is a, you know, that China is a near Antarctic country. Uh, and they're sending cruise ships down there, to, you know, for Chinese tourists to be like, hey, this is basically going to be 
China's place at some point. And that's what I honestly, you know, if anyone takes anything on this, I, I, I would love it if we oriented to both poles. Thanks for that perspective. That's definitely true. Um, I, I knew, as promised, you are next. Um, what are your thoughts on do we need a new Arctic narrative um, and where should it face? Um, I think the uh, there is a strong change in narrative required, and I think it is related to uh, treating Arctic as a global co uh, commons. And I take this cue from uh, uh, Ryan Burke's uh, discussion earlier uh, this afternoon uh, in this panel. And uh, I think we need to do this in order to uh, preserve the dwindling ecosystem of the Arctic region. And uh, secondly, uh, the narrative should change, uh, I think, a bit uh, from um, if we can do uh, the initiation of the demilitarization of the Arctic region, in fact, declaring it a nuclear weapons region, though I understand that uh, doing it right now is uh, uh, might be impossible, but we can think about it. Demilitarization will solve a lot of problems, a lot of uh, environmental and uh, strategic problems of, for this region. And thirdly, uh, uh, like I could see the uh, discussion in the chat box that what could India do? I think uh, uh, the narrative for India, change of narrative from India perspective could uh, be that what we could offer to this uh, significant discussion, as in what we can bring it to the table. And of course, we need to, and India, as, as, as a speaker from India, India needs to explain how we can use our immense potential and expertise and uh, substantially uh, contribute to this region and then utilize this experience for our own benefit in our own region. We are a tripolar region. So in our case, how can the research and the studies we done uh, by our people in this region can be utilized for the uh, uh, Himalayan glaciers and how it can help us? So I think th that is uh, my two cents from uh, for this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Anil, and thanks for joining us. Um, Colonel Nicholson, I think you're next. Uh, what are your thoughts, especially from an operational perspective on, on what the narrative uh, needs to be? Well, I'll, I'll kind of, I guess, sum up what I've heard from everybody else, and I think it reflects my own thinking, is that we just have to understand that human activity and occupancy is going to increase uh, in the Arctic area. And so we talked a lot about, uh, you know, increased defense, law enforcement, infrastructure, economic activity. And so I'll, I'll, I'll use my, my brief little time here just to throw one more thought out, and that's search and rescue. So as we start, uh, the shipping increases, the... Uh, source for uh, the, the, uh, the search for resources, tourism. You can buy a ticket and go through the Northwest Passage and uh, stop along the way and play golf and go hiking. Uh, so that, that barrier region is now a place where people are and, and are doing activities, but there is very, very, very limited capability that if something goes wrong uh, to get people help. Uh, you know, the, along the Northern Sea route, the Russians actually charge for that. That's why you have to pay a fee. Uh, you don't have to pay that fee, but you don't have to get rescued either if you have a problem uh, or you're going to pay a lot more for rescue. You know, obviously along the uh, Northwest Passage, Northern Alaska, Northern Canada, th through to Greenland and down the East Coast. Yeah, you're going to get help, uh, but there's just not much out there. And so something we're looking at and we're working very heavily on is, you know, what forces do we need in the region to match the increased human activity? Uh, you know, what are those forces? Is, is it pure Coast Guard? Is it military? Is it a mix of commercial solutions? Can I contract somebody to, uh, you know, position helicopters up on the north slope and be ready to go? It's just a, you know, even though I keep talking about, you know, it's it's getting easier to operate there. It's still really hard, and there's very limited capabilities up there if someone gets into trouble. Uh, so I'll leave with that, and thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Thanks for joining us. Um, and General Key, I'm I'm going to round out with you. Um, what are your thoughts on? Oh, Amy, first of all, thank you. Uh, you've done an exceptional job of hosting uh, and moderating, I would say. So I thank you for your graciousness and your and your very thoughtful approach. I'd also like to compliment all my colleagues on this panel. It's been a privilege to visit with you and to, to gain your insights. Tremendous, uh, tremendous views across the board, and I'm grateful for those reflections I've learned from each of you. When you look at the aspects of the of the Arctic region, it is part of a polar perspective, and I, I, and I find some value to that. Uh, I've actually had the privilege of spending some time in Australia and Tasmania talking uh, to our Australian colleagues and New Zealand colleagues in thinking about the interconnections between 
the Antarctic and Arctic regions. Ultimately, it's a place where great uh, powers or fuel strategic competition is underway. Uh, right now, this, you know, the, uh, the folks in Beijing are putting uh, as many vessels in the southern oceans to essentially vacuum up as much krill as they can get their vacuum hose around. And ultimately, uh, a limitless supply, uh, just into, up, up until just a couple of years ago, is now looking like, oh my gosh, there may even be limits to krill in the southern oceans. Uh, so there is, a, in fact, one strategic difference, of course, between uh, the, the, the Arctic and Antarctic regions that right now, the Antarctic region is governed by a treaty. Uh, there is no such treaty in the Arctic region. It is also, of course, fundamentally different, a land mass surrounded by Southern Oceans, as opposed to essentially uh, a, a littoral region uh, with a relatively small inland sea, if you will, when you look at it from a strategic context. It does also, when you look at the Arctic regions, area that every ounce of, just about every ounce of uh, maritime basin is claimed by some nation in that region. There's very little open space is not being claimed by someone under the aspects of the United Nations Convention of the Law on the Sea and the Extended Continental Shelf perspective. A lot of claims have been worked out in court, and ultimately I do hope that those do get a chance to be heard in court and they're ultimately made to some decisions in a way that respects the rule of law. And ultimately then the nations that uh, have so adjudicated can comply with the, the rule of law. I would also mention that it is a reason that uh, the polar perspective matters uh, in the context of I have the privilege of serving. In fact, I just came back from Washington, D.C. on the International Part of Engagement Program for Polar Research, where I had the privilege of serving as the U.S. Situational Awareness Working Group Chair, again, principally focused on science, technology, R&D, that is really focused on reducing the risk for operators in the polar regions by a stone soup approach between the countries of Finland, Sweden, Norway, um, Denmark, Canada, the United States, and New Zealand. And so that aspect, it does uh, have some great personal uh, value from my vantage point. I would also comment on the remark that uh, was made regarding the role of the Indian, uh, the Indo-Pacific nations, in, including India, uh, in the aspects of the Arctic. Many nations in the Western Pacific and East Asia uh, claim Arctic interests. And from my vantage point, if their intentions are good and finding the way to to, to be a part of the region uh, in a way that uh, is, is helpful and help, helps if you advance the rule of law, safe uh, resource extraction done in a way that's environment is and brings environmental stewardship, tremendous value to that. Ultimately, uh, there is a role for nations outside the Arctic to, to operate within and get to do so safe in the Arctic region. Tourism is one part of it, resource extraction is another. Maritime shipping is another aspect. Um, and there is also a connection between the high latitudes and the high altitudes. There's much to be learned between those two aspects. And I certainly know that our colleagues in the, the military ultimately do have that perspective. I've actually spoken to colleagues in, in Chile um, and also in Nepal, thinking about the aspects of how we can learn from each other when we try to learn about the challenges of operating in the high latitudes and the high latitudes. I'd like to close in the aspect though that uh, first of all, the, the test of Center for Arctic Sea Studies was announced by the uh, Secretary of Defense on the 9th of June uh, this year. I had the privilege of being uh, coming aboard as a Senior Advisor for Arctic Security Affairs for this new sixth DOD Regional Center. It is a center oriented to educate, uh, to study, research and analyze, and then to conduct engagement and outreach uh, oriented at this point to the Arctic region. In this aspect, we work uh, with the other regional centers, the established regional centers, specifically the George C. Marshall Center uh, for European Security Studies, the uh, William J. Perry Center for Western, uh, for Western Hemisphere Defense Studies, and ultimately, uh, the, and also the uh, Daniel K. Inouye Center for Asia Pacific Security Studies uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii, working all three of those centers to, uh, to advance a collaborative approach for defense studies, uh, engagement, and more in the, uh, oriented to the Arctic region. And in that aspect, these are early days for us. There's much to be learned, and this, this discussion today ultimately has helped advance some of those perspectives. So I thank Dr. Rockwell for the chance to, to, to contribute to the recent article and ultimately to establish a, a budding partnership between us and our good colleagues at Air University. As a former graduate of Air War College, our command staff college, and, and as Squadron Officer School back in the day, I have great appreciation for uh, the power of the think tanks and more there at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. It's not a very fun place to be in the summertime, though, just saying. Um, lastly, though, to me, to our colleagues on the call here, um, yeah, this aspect is important. Deterrence is not appeasement. 
It requires the view that we must do all we can to dissuade escalation. We also have to be prepared though to, to have uh, an array of options in both hard and soft power that essentially tries to manage escalation, that seeks to dissuade, deter, and then if not able to defeat. We have to have firmest resolve that our national interests will not be uh, dictated to us by, both by forces who oppose our way of thinking and our way of life. The Center of uh, Security Studies that will be named and honored or Center of Ted Stevens could do no less than offer our very best to provide essentially that soft power complement to the hard power solution our nations already invested and to do so with our allies and partners because the strength of the United States is certainly of our own national uh, origins and, and investments, but also the strength of our nation is because we respect the rule of law. And, we were, and we've created a network of allies and partners who share this firm resolve to essentially seeking peaceful solutions. And then if peaceful solutions cannot be attained, then for our finding the ways with the measurements of escalation that are done, that are governed uh, by the rule, uh, rules of law and the rules of warfare to do this in a way that, that really says to those who would oppose us, today is not the day to take on the United States or our allies and partners, respectfully submitted. I appreciate those comments. Um, I can hand it back over to you, Dr. Rockwell. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you to the panelists for putting up with um, my questions. Um, Doc. Uh, th thank you, Amy. I pre appreciate it, and, and and thank you very much for for your job moderating today. It was a fantastic job. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists, uh, our moderator and our highly engaged audience for a fantastic discussion. And I we do this. this these sorts of things quite quite frequently with the uh, the journal and and the uh, the consortium and you know sometimes when we when we have these everybody's in complete agreement with one another and it gets kind of boring. I definitely think we can say today that that was not the case. Uh, we we definitely pr were provided by our panelists with with a variety of different perspectives and uh, I think that's very important moving forward and I think uh, it bodes well for future engagements uh, through the center and and uh, hopefully. Uh, in, in collaborative efforts that we move that we have moving forward. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Joint Special Operations University, the Ted Stevens Center for Arctic Security Studies, and the US Special Operations Command for their collaboration in putting this event together. We obviously couldn't have done it without you. Uh, our expertise is uh, you know a little bit further south than what we, we talked about today uh, for the most part. And uh, I, I very much appreciate uh, your, your willingness to, to take on the, the, the roles that you did for this. Uh, JIPA and the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers look forward to many such collaborative efforts moving forward. In fact, we're hoping to have another one next month. There were a few of our um, authors who contributed to our special issue that, we mentioned, that was mentioned earlier uh, that weren't able to attend today. And we hope to uh, be able to bring them into that other uh, discussion. And obviously, we would like to have uh, uh, General uh, Key uh, join us for that as well. As, and as our other contributors, uh, definitely would like to have them in the audience, if not on, on screen as well. So thank you very much uh, for everything. Um, and uh, I'll stick around for a few minutes after this, if anybody wants to chit chat for a little bit, but uh, we'll stop the recording here. Thank you.